all so much for, for coming uh, back today um, to join us uh, with a session with one of my dear, dear friends and colleagues, Dr. Ananda Kona Ponte. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce um, all of you to her and vice versa. Dr. Kona Ponte is an associate professor of art history um, at Cornell, and she holds a joint appointments um, in other graduate fields. And uh, I'm mentioning some of these things about her CV, just so that you can um, think about how you might imagine yourself should you wish to go on to do your PhD in art history um, and how you can work in say either a small college um, like Spelman or Morehouse or a larger university like Clark Atlanta University, uh, Cornell or, or Emory. And I'm just thinking of places that might be familiar and nearby. Um, so Dr. Kona Ponte also um, holds um, positions in the Cornell Institute of Archaeology and Material Studies, um, and also the Latino Studies uh, Program and Latin American Studies Program um, at Cornell. And she has interests in the visual culture of colonial Latin America, um, with a special focus on issues of cross-cultural exchange, historicity, identity, and anti-colonial movements. Her research and teaching also explores the legacies of colonialism. And I'm gonna pause here um, uh, just to say that um, Dr. Kona Ponte, I know that we have a number of students here on the call who are really interested in your approaches to decolonial methodologies in art history, especially. Um, and I think a really great example of that is your first book, Heaven, Hell, and Everything in Between, Murals of the Colonial Andes, Andes excuse me, um, which was published in 2016 by the University of uh, Texas Press. And this book explores the intersections between art, politics, religion, and society, the mural paintings located in colonial churches across the Southern Andes. And Dr. Kona Ponte's um, research uh, has been focused primarily in Peru, but also um, in Central and, and uh, Central America and, and sort of cross, across the Atlantic um, as well. Um, in thinking about work that would take place um, in uh, different parts of, of Europe too. Um, another thing that I just want to say, you know, when I think about our title, uh, Dr. Kona Ponte, it's, it's a Pathways title, and that's a title that's really, I think, um, important for you in terms of thinking about the kind of work that you're interested in doing and activating, for example, uh, young minds, whether they be college students or, or high school age students, and thinking about what one's pathway might be into a field um, that has traditionally not really considered our art histories or our bodies and ourselves within in the field. So I think without um, much further ado, I'd like to just welcome you to the stage and thank you so much for taking the time today to speak with us during our virtual career week. Welcome. Thank you so much, Cheryl. It's such an honor to be um, part of this. I'm really excited to share a little bit about my own journey. Um, and thank you so much also to the all the staff at AUC that has made this happen. I have to say I'm following AUC Collective on Instagram. Um, it's amazing the things that are coming out of Spelman. And um, I know that it's, it's, a, it's a team effort. And so I'm just really grateful to be part of, of, of some really exciting um, things happening at Spelman. So let me um, queue up my PowerPoint and let me know if this um, shows up. Oh, I guess I disappeared, but can everyone, I don't even know if I would be able to see um, actually, let me switch to presenter view if that works. We, we don't see your PowerPoint yet. Oh, okay, hold on. Oh, that's right. Oh, sorry, guys. I'm a little bit of a Zoom novice, as I mentioned. I have to share my screen. Um, let's see. Um, oh, wait, hold on. I'm sorry, I think it's- okay, Do you see the green button at the bottom with the arrow that's- yeah. Oh, okay. I think it's telling me that, um... oh, hold on. I think it might make me quit Zoom and then log back and then I have to log back in to let it see my screen. Okay. Hold on, okay. 
in the meantime, how's everyone holding up? Hi, Dr. Um, I'm doing- Hi, Tanaya. So good to see you earlier today. Yes, I'm eating lunch right now, which is why my camera oh, is- Oh, no off. worries. I'm, I'm drinking coffee in front of you. So um, that was a fantastic question. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I right. thought about it because I know he mentioned Sotheby's and I know that Sotheby's did the same thing when they, I forgot the name of it. I don't know if it was like art advisors or art agency or something when they bought out the people who were really great art advisors in the field and then it became mm -hmm. part of Sotheby's. So I just thought like, oh, I wonder if he's interested in that or not. Yeah, no, it was, it was a great, it was a great question. And I think he dropped a lot of great pearls uh, of wisdom for us all. Hi. You're muted. I made the choice of completely like redoing, uh, doing a, a computer update right before this. So tell me now if you can see my uh, PowerPoint. It's beautiful, we got it. Yes, all right. So let me just dive in and get started. Um, I wanted to talk to all of you today about some of about my journey into art history and about some of the projects that I've been working on. And I wanted to first pause briefly at the the first slide in the PowerPoint because it is a scene that is really powerful and grounding to me. Um, as you can see here, there is a demonstration happening within the halls of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Um, and this was organized by a bunch of um, youth and activists, uh, predominantly um, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, call, who are part of an organization called Decolonize This Place. And since 2016, they have really been um, making moves in terms of pushing a museum's institutions to decolonize and to um, step up in terms of the ways that they have handled um, art, the way that they present history and the way that they present culture within their walls. Um, and to also particularly for the American Museum of Natural History to protest the um, Theodore Roosevelt statue that has recently been removed from the, the grounds of the museum. And I bring this slide in because I worked there for two years when I was um, right out of undergrad. I started out as a curatorial intern in the anthropology department. And then I was later on hired as a curatorial, uh, a collections assistant. And I remember the halls of the Museum of, of Natural History very well. And never in my wildest dreams, uh, me of 2004, uh, would have ever expected or imagined that something like this could have happened within this place where I had worked. Um, so sort of similar to the dinosaur that you see in front and center of that building. Um, I always had this impression that institutions were um, incredibly static and almost glacial and that this type of activism simply was not possible. Um, my experiences there were very, I mean, I had a, a really interesting educational experience, but in terms of mentorship or in terms of seeing other um, people of color within those halls, that was something that was deeply lacking. Um, and so that was something that at that time I took as a given that um, the number of Black, Latinx and Indigenous folks who are occupying higher levels of um, who, are, who are occupying the curatorial positions um, and the, the other uh, types of research positions within the museum simply weren't there. And I had accepted this narrative that um, the predominant stewards of cultures around the world of their materials and of their art uh, was in the hands of white professionals. And so it really wasn't until much later, um, partly inspired by seeing so much of the activism that was occurring um, at the leadership of young people that um, many of that, those preconceptions started to change for me. 
And so I'll start with that and we can return later to these questions of decolonizing because I know that's of particular interest. But I wanted to just take the opportunity to talk a little bit more about some of the institutions that have shaped me um, as a scholar. And when I think back on that now, I have to um, identify two in particular. One um, is my high school, Northwest School of the Arts. Um, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, so not too far from Atlanta. And um, this is one of the first places where art history as a career option or as something that I realized that I was good at um, became a reality for me. Um, just as a little bit of background, Northwest School of the Arts is an amazing place. It's a magnet school for the arts dedicated to the visual and performing arts. And I had the, um, the privilege and the luck of being able to attend for the last three years of my high school education. And I was a visual arts major. I thought that I wanted to become an artist. Um, I was something that I was really interested in and fascinated by. I was into painting and mixed media. Um, but when I was a senior, um, Northwest was able to offer AP classes for the very first time. So I, of course, immediately took AP Studio and all of that. And there was this one class that was offered for the very first time, and it was taught by the ceramics teacher, Miss Barefoot, I'll never forget her name, um, and it was AP Art History. And this was a new experience for all of us, for students and for the teachers. Um, we didn't even really have the right textbooks. It was kind of, everyone was kind of winging it because it was the very first time that it had ever been offered. Um, but that moment of um, taking a class in art history um, and having the luck and the, and the privilege of being able to do so at the high school level really was a game changer for me. Um, that being said, the type of art history that we learned, um, as you might be able to imagine, was one that was heavily influenced by the European tradition. So I remember the, the art history textbook that we used, um, it had King Tut and I was trying so hard to find it because I was like, which is the art history book with King Tut on the front? But I found it, it was discovering art history. So um, we it was like a textbook that was geared towards probably a middle school audience. Um, uh, but that between that and videos that were narrated by Sister Wendy, I don't know if people are familiar with her, but she, I actually think she recently passed away. She was um, an, an art loving nun who would give tours of different convents and of museums all across Europe. So I got this instruction in art history that to in in the in that moment was very transformative because i always hated history class i could never remember dates i remember falling asleep with my head buried in my history book i could never um none of the concepts really stuck for me but being a visual person and being an artist i saw that art history offered something that was really amazing which was that i could look at an image and be able to locate it within history. And that was something that for me was like the light bulb went off because I was really into art. I was also into academics and this was like that perfect melding of the two. Um, and I found that, you know, I was able to remember historical events by looking at art produced during that time. Now, um, that being said, it was an extremely limited narrative of art history. And it was one that was very neatly and elegantly packaged. And it felt like everything fit together. You know, you learn everything from the caves of Lascaux to Greco-Roman to Renaissance to Baroque to, you know, to Impressionism. And it all created like this beautiful, harmonious timeline that all fit together. But implicit in that narrative was the utter exclusion of any artistic traditions of 
people from outside of Europe, right? So the artistic traditions of Africa, of Latin America, of Oceania, of Asia were effectively eliminated from our instruction. And of course, I don't fault the teachers for this. We, this was all of a new um, experience. But um, at the same time that we were learning something very vital, we were also learning a lot of untruths about who are artists in history, who, who are the artists that are worthy of study, what are the artistic movements that are worthy of study, what is considered art and what is not. So armed with this very Eurocentric understanding of art history, I entered into undergraduate and I went to the University of Michigan for my undergrad career. And I immediately decided to double major in art history and anthropology. And like many of you, um, I decided to pursue a museum internship um, in my hometown this year after freshman year. I just wanted to get my feet wet. I had expanded my knowledge of European art history. So I had taken another survey and I was just blown away by French Impressionism. And I was into um, Poussin and Courbet and the Impressionists and realism. And I decided to um, pursue an internship at the Mint Museum of Art. And this was a museum that I had uh, um, gone to many times growing up. We would go on um, vi school visits and things of that nature. And I remember I applied and there was an opening um, in European painting. And I told the, I had an interview with the curator and I said, I wanna study European painting. Um, that's what I wanna do. And they told me, um, well, unfortunately that position has already been filled, but we do have this internship opportunity for you if you're interested that has to do with the Mesoamerican ball game. And I have on the screen here, um, the cover of that catalog uh, for the show that they wanted me to work on. And I thought to myself, Mesoamerican art, what is that? I, I, was, I was completely dumbfounded. Um, I had no idea what Mesoamerican art was. And they said, oh, you know, pre-Columbian. And I'm thinking, what does that, what does that even mean pre-Columbian? And of course I started to put the pieces together, pre-Columbian being uh, before Columbus. This is the artistic tradition of indigenous peoples before Spanish colonization in Latin America. Well, I must say I'm, now speaking from adult me, I'm embarrassed to say this, but this is the truth. Um, when I was given the opportunity, I thought to myself, oh, I don't wanna study this art. It's ugly, it's, um, it's not elegant, it's not European, it's not highbrow. You know, they didn't even make paintings. These are, it's a ceramics. And it was all a product of both internalized racism as well as the inherently white and Eurocentric curriculum that I had really um, internalized and normalized up to that point. And um, I still, of course, went through with the internship and I have to say, hands down, this was the experience that put me on the path that I am on now, right? So after the um, internship, I learned all about Mesoamerican art. I learned all about um, indigenous arts of the Americas and it completely flipped a switch in me in the same way that art history in high school allowed me to understand that you can, under, that you can learn history through the image. Um, this experience made me realize everything I had learned about art history was wrong um, because suddenly this beautiful, elegant narrative of this march of civilization and of European um, art predominantly painting being this one fluid trajectory towards greatness, suddenly Mesoamerican art throws it all for a loop, right? Because the Aztecs were in, um, around right at the same time as the European Renaissance, yet they're described as ancient or pre-modern. So all of a sudden my timelines, my geographies, my preconceived notions of what art history can be were challenged, but they were challenged in the most productive way possible. Um, and so I really am grateful for these formative experiences that I had um, because they were ones of both discovery, but also of rigorous self-examination and unlearning. 
Um, and I also think too, being Latina and specifically Cuban American, um, although I don't share um, precise history with um, these pre-Columbian civilizations, um, I feel that in those early years, my disavowal of it as somehow not as good as or um, inferior to European art was its own type of internalized racism because of the types of experiences and the types of education that I had had up until that point. So this is switching gears really abruptly, but I wanted to just very briefly talk about some of the um, research that I'm currently undertaking. And then I'll sort of loop back around to this whole question of decolonization of art history and some of the more activism, activist components of the work that I've been doing. So as Cheryl mentioned, my previous book focused on mural paintings of the colonial Andes. And so after that experience at the Mint Museum, my, my interest really moved into Latin America. And for me, learning about Latin America during the colonial period, um, both in undergrad as well as in graduate school was a tremendous moment of self-reflection. Um, for the first time, I felt that elements of my history that had just been totally erased or that I was ignorant about um, actually had roots deep in history. And for me, that was something that was really powerful to be able to see myself reflected in the visual archive, to be able to see where the legacies of racism come from in Latin America and its diaspora. Um, all roads lead back to this initial moment of colonial invasion and encounter. And so that has really fueled um, a lot of the work that I do now. And so my current project is focused on um, the intersections between art and rebellion in the 18th century. Um, and so just as a very, very brief history lesson, um, the age of revolutions really occurred all throughout the 18th and early 19th century Atlantic world. And so my project is focused on something known as the Tupac Amaru Rebellion, which happened in Peru um, from 1780 to 1783. But concurrent with this were a whole lot of other rebellions and revolts that were happening across South America, Mesoamerica, the Caribbean, the entire Atlantic world. So that's why we refer to it as an age of revolutions. You had um, the several Andean rebellions that were happening. You have the Haitian revolution that's happening 1794 to 1803. So revolution is in the air. And what I'm really interested in, in particular for this book project is how these um, indigenous insurgencies that sought to overthrow Spanish colonial rule, um, how the visual arts were um, interacting with these social movements. And so one thing that I'm really interested in is how these mov movements of resistance become systematically erased by the power structures that were actively suppressing them. And so one um, thing that really, um, one of the, the biggest conundrums of the research that I do is that this indigenous led but multiracial anti-colonial movement was full of art. If you look at the archival descriptions, there are descriptions of paintings, of banners, of medallions, of um, textiles, of all of these different works of art that were being produced in the service of this anti-colonial movement. However, the vast majority of those things no longer survive. Um, and so these histories um, of indigenous resistance they survive um, in these very fragmentary ways because the artwork itself was considered to be too powerful and too dangerous. And it was systematically destroyed through censorship campaigns and other uh, mechanisms of social control. So what do we have left? What we have left is the infrastructure of surveillance um, and of, of control over land and, and people's bodies. And so one thing that I'm focused on for this project are maps. So one that you're looking at here is located in the British Library, this tracking the movement of the troops 
um, that were actively suppressing and eventually defeating the insurgents. Um, I'm also interested in maps that show infrastructures of control like fortresses and prisons. Um, and so these all came about in the immediate aftermath of this rebellion as a way of trying to reassert control over this landscape. Um, I'm also interested in portraits and medallions that sought to um, replicate the eye of the state um, or uh, the, the view or the, the, uh, the vision and the surveillance of the state through portraits and coins that are bearing the faces of kings and bureaucrats and viceroys. And so at the same time that you have this um, massive production of art in the service of suppression, um, the, you also are dealing with the absence of revolutionary art that had been produced in the immediate years preceding that. Um, one other thing and the aspect of this research that really fascinates me is this question of the censorship of canvases. Um, and so one of the most famous and iconic examples of this is this painting of the Lord of the Earthquakes, which is a crucifixion um, that is very uh, popular within the, the Southern Andes. And through some restoration campaigns, they realized that lurking beneath this Christ figure is a painting of an Andean noblewoman named Manuela Tupac Amaru. And so um, we can see then how history becomes mediated through um, the painterly process. And the only ways that we're able to recover some of these pasts that have been suppressed and erased is through modern interventions like um, restoration and also um, like uh, infrared reflectography and other types of scientific um, interventions onto canvases. Um, but at the same time that you had this active erasure of the figure of Tupac Amaro during the rebellion, in the 20th century, you had a revival of interest in this movement. And I think that this is just as important um, as the rebellion itself, because it's telling us what were the moments in history when the past becomes reactivated and why is it becoming reactivated? Well, in this case, we have the rise of, um, of the agrarian reform movement in Peru and Tupac Amaro is being reimagined um, as this national hero. And for the, very, for the very first time, he finally has a face um, because as I had mentioned, portraits of him and other artworks associated with him had been um, destroyed um, in the aftermath of the rebellion. So you have posters that are bearing his face for the very first time. Um, you have political slogans and posters that are reimagining what he looked like. And so at the same time that you have this galvaniz galvanizing of interest in um, agrarian reform and liberation um, in, modern, in, in modern Peru, you're also seeing this look to the past as um, a way of trying to connect all the dots um, and to, to rewrite or to reimagine history through a different lens that had been um, out of view until this moment. Um, and the Tupac Amaro rebellion may also, the name Tupac Amaro may also sound familiar to us, of course, because this was the name um, that Afeni Shakur gave to her son. Um, and I just put this quote up here. I wanted him to have the name of a revolutionary indigenous people in the world. I wanted him to know that he was part of a world culture and not just from a neighborhood. And so we can also see how black and indigenous liberation movements start to intersect, um, particularly with the, the rise of the Black Panthers, um, who were looking to not only um, history of the United States, but also liberation movements across the Americas for inspiration. And so this also becomes a very important, important point of intersection when we're thinking about um, the ways that um, our shared histories are being recouped and reimagined in the service of um, political projects. So, um, 
So that, so my interest in these anti-colonial movements um, are of course in no way divorced from what's happening right now in 2020. Um, as we're dealing with um, co multiple overlapping crises of COVID-19, of um, liberation movements, of the fight for Black lives, um, of BIPOC um, uh, coalition building that's happening um, at every level of, of society, um, and of also of calls to decolonize our institutions. Well, what does that really mean? And how do we get there? Um, I had done a little bit of preliminary research and this is um, looking specifically at statistics around Latinx um, college enrollment and participation within the discipline of art history. Um, and this is from the research that I had done for a paper on the subject. Um, but we know that Latinx student enrollment in the past decade has increased by 114%. Um, and we know that the same has, it goes for African-American student enrollment and that black women in particular are the most educated demographic in the entire United States. These are facts and numbers that need to be constantly, that we need to constantly remind people about. Um, Latinx students make up 17% of college enrollments and that number continues to grow, but uh, we make up 4% of all full-time professors in the United States. And the numbers um, for um, Black folks and specifically Black women are around that same percentage number. Uh, the numbers are even more dismal for the humanities and even more so for art history. And so what do we do with that? Well, and how do we get to a point of equity within our disciplines? Um, in my mind, it cannot start uh, by the time people are going to graduate school. It can't start at the by the time people are applying for jobs. If we are thinking about um, decolonizing our institutions and following the important path that has already been laid out by activists and scholars who are pushing for equity, it needs to start much earlier in the game. Um, and I think back, you know, to my formative years in high school that I was describing to all of you and how I had just implicitly accepted so many narratives about society and about history. And so much of my education in undergraduate and grad school was actively dedicated to unlearning so, so much of the mythology that I had embodied and that I had digested. And so, of course, I, you can't help but think about this iconic scene from Black Panther um, where Killmonger is being followed by guards, where a white woman curator is the purveyor and the steward of this heritage um, and is speaking to him in this very condescending way. And of course, this is cinematography and this is um, a movie, but I think it, it definitely hits at um, issues that have needed to be addressed for many years and are finally starting to come into a national conversation. Um, I think about protests at the Brooklyn Museum or at the American Museum of Natural History. And in order for us to have a critical mass of Black, Indigenous, Latinx curators, scholars, visionaries, and thinkers who are ready to push the conversation forward, um, we need to be a, we need to address this at the K through 12 level um, so that instead of having to go to university where you unlearn everything, you can build on what you're learning from your educational experience prior to entering into the college, um, into the college classroom. Um, so one thing that I've been really interested in is how can I use my expertise um, and my position of power to, um, to broaden the scope of who's able to access art history. And so one of the things that I've been really inspired by is this oral history program at UNC Chapel Hill that institutes something called Archivist in a Backpack. And so it's giving youth, uh, undergraduates, but also youth tools to conduct their own oral histories. 
And so that's something that for me is really powerful in terms of thinking of what, how we can uh, adjust this for art history, because art history is not something that just happens within museum walls. Um, it's not something that just happens within galleries. Our entire built environment has a history. There's vernacular art. There's the art that we ourselves are creating on our phones or that we're circulating, um, that we have as the backdrops drops of our Zoom calls. And so every image has a history. And what if we were empowering youth to not only become consumers of that knowledge, but also active producers of art historical knowledge. Because I have to say, uh, with Gen Z, I mean, you guys are like on the edge of, of brilliance in terms of the ways that Gen Z youth are able to um, manipulate images, to circulate images, to contextualize them, to create memes, um, to make humor out of historical images, juxtaposing them with um, all sorts of messages. All of that is art history. Um, and so it's a question of building on the pre-existing expertise that so many of our youth already have that old dinosaurs like me, I mean, I can't even begin to, to go there, but I can, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the amount of digital knowledge that um, our youth have and are going to continue to build on. Um, so this is something that inspired me to teach a class in conjunction with my Latin American art history survey called The Resistance That Cannot Be Stopped. Because I thought to myself, if I'm really interested in this question of decolonization, if I really am interested in um, democratizing and decolonizing art history and opening it up um, to people of color, to um, community organizations, I need to put my money where my mouth is and I need to actually see how this ha can happen in practice because it's one thing to be at the top of the hill at Cornell teaching my classes and it's quite another to be doing the work on the ground. And so um, this was the result of a, an amazing collaboration with a grassroots organization in Ithaca called the Multicultural Resource Center. Uh, which is led um, exclusively by Black and Indigenous women um, and is an incredible resource and has continued to be, especially in um, the wake of COVID um, and all of the, um, all of the um, events that have been happening as of late in terms of creating a space for people to be able to do creative work, um, to be able to heal, to be able to talk with one another. And so um, this uh, class was um, building off of a pre-existing program called The Resistance Cannot Be Stopped. And in it, um, I got together my undergraduate students who were taking this survey to um, bring their expertise and their knowledge outside of the art history classroom. And so we did um, an exhibition within the space of the Multicultural Resource Center. Um, students engaged in oral histories with elders uh, within, and youth in the community. Uh, we had an, an exhibition that happened within the space. Um, and we also produced educational materials, or I should rather say not we, the students, um, in collaboration with folks at MRC, producing educational materials so that teachers within the Ithaca school system could use the images and the information from the exhibit to teach to their own students to really try to bridge this gap that we're talking about in terms of the very damaging racist narratives that are often trotted out within the K through 12 system versus what students are getting access to or the knowledge that students are learning within the undergraduate classroom. Um, and so this of course was a pre-COVID um, endeavor. As you can see, we have a room full of crowded people which it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, but I do think that this is something that I really hope to continue in the future once we're able to um, be outside of the digital realm. And I'm also interested too in how we can use the digital um, talks like this through Zoom are really incredible. Um, how can we use the digital to also um, uh, move these projects forward 
even when we're not able to congregate in person in the same way that we used to be able to. So I think I've talked enough. Um, I know this was a really whirlwind tour of what I've been up to and how I got to where I am, but I'm happy to answer any questions whatsoever that you might have about um, graduate school, about art history, about decolonization, um, anything whatsoever is fair game. So thank you all for listening and for, for being part of this. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? I know you do. Any of the students? Just turn your mic off and ask if you can. So I don't have any like, Normal questions, I guess, but I did have, have like a lot of thoughts um, from when I did get into your presentation and I really did enjoy it. Um, and I guess rethinking through some of the ways we perceive our history. Um, I feel like your presentation kind of illuminated some of the, I guess, threads that I've been thinking about or some of the things that we've been uncovering uh, through our like curriculum. Um, but I guess one of the, the biggest ones is just how we, um, view or contextualize our history or I guess categorize it, which is I've like, been like a huge topic um, in my theories and critiques class on like thinking about um, where these notions of, I guess, categorize not only people, but like, well, well, well starting with people, how like we categorize them and how that affects uh, how we perceive artwork. Um, like you mentioned earlier, like how one, one uh, civil, uh, civilization could be seen as primitive and other one uh, not so much, but they were happening at the same time. I think those type of interjections are very interesting. And I'm not sure if I have a question yet, but I did have a lot of thoughts um, on your presentation today. No, thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, and I can elaborate a little bit more about that because I think that um, so much of our K through 12 education is is very much dedicated to perpetuating certain mythologies about the United States uh, and also conflating that with the world and conflating that with your United States, Europe um, as, the, as a proxy for the world. And when, of course, we talk about the United States, we're talking about white history within the United States. Um, having grown up in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, we took, we would go on field trips to um, plantations. We learned about um, the history of the Civil War from watching Gone with the Wind. I mean, and it's, it's shameful. Mm -hmm. And students um, come away from their educational experience oftentimes with tremendous amount of trauma as a result of this mis miseducation. So I think that it can, is something that, um, sh you know, the type of imperial and racist education that many of us come out of um, requires, it requires an overhaul and it requires deep reflection. Um, I am much older, so I think things have changed a little bit since I was growing up, um, but it really didn't occur to me until I was basically halfway through my undergraduate years, um, just how much I had to unlearn. Um, and so really in terms of expanding my geography and, uh, and in the process, um, realizing what damage that had done to my own sense of self and my own self-worth of thinking that Latin American, people of Latin America are um, beneath um, that of Europe, right? Or third world or underdeveloped um, or of thinking, you know, well, Latino people are not very smart. Um, you know, I don't see any of them at teaching my college classes. Uh, I didn't have, I only had one professor of color for my entire undergraduate career. Um, and so these are all things that, that I think about a lot when, um, 
when I think about mentoring my own students and when I think about the responsibility that I have to make sure that those types of um, educational traumas are not perpetuated, at least none, not under my own watch. No, I, I completely agree. And I've resonated with everything you said, I resonated with because I think I, I studied art history um, in, in high school for AP art history, but I went on to Howard University, which is a HBCU and studied art history there. And even from going from the two years in high school to college at a black school, it was completely different in terms of the, the what I learned. Black, I mean, knowing that they were black, no, like notable artists um, having that were completely misplaced from the textbook in terms of timeline. It just, it's it's astounding what, you know, what we're, we're learning now, but I think hopefully education has changed. Um, I think what our students are learning and what you're telling them is one, going to open their minds up to more. Um, and I'm hoping we also have to do the work to change in what we know and what we implement in course in, in our coursework as well. So, you know, I think, yes, all, everything you said. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I just have to say, I'm so impressed. I, I already said this, but I'll say it again. I'm so impressed with what Spellman is doing with the AUC and all of that. And I think that the entire country needs to take note. Um, and I think they are um, because this is the way that this is how it should be. Um, and so I'm so grateful to all of you and to Cheryl and to everyone who's making this happen because it's something that is going to have resounding impact uh, for the generations to come in terms of building a critical mass of, um, of black curators to do the important work that has needed to be done for so long. Yes. Great, does anybody have any more questions or comments? Um, yes, hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Jasmine and I am the graduate research assistant for the AUC Collective. Um, I wanna thank you for your presentation as it resonated with me as well um, in a number of areas, specifically your interest in early or I won't say early United States history, but pre-Columbian history as you described, um, as well as um, your interest in indigeneity and um, some of the comments that you made about African and um, indigenous or native indigeneity and like how those communities interact with each other is something that I often think about in terms of my own research. And um, I know that you mentioned some of the challenges that you face in just being able to locate certain items just because of the fact that um, a lot of those items were either destroyed or um, missing or, you know, just, we just don't have records for that. So I was curious actually, if you could maybe speak a bit more about that and like in doing research um, on specific like communities as even like com maroon communities, right? That like existed in what we now call the United States, um, like years before Europeans even got here. Like, um, you know, how, how do you go about doing research like that as an art historian? And um, what is that process like for you? What are some of the archives that you're going to? And um, how do you mitigate some of those challenges of just lack of material culture available? Uh, that's such a beautifully put question. And it's something that has, really um, taken my attention for, for the past number of years as I'm working on this book that I like, I can't even begin to start it because I just keep doing more and more research. Mm -hmm. um, but it really hit cut, it hits at the heart of the, the conundrum, which is how do you write an art history when you don't have the art object? And I remember I was um, workshopping a, pay, a chapter or what will later become a chapter for this book with a colleague and they essentially said that. And I took that as a provocation to figure out, well, how is this, how, how can we make this possible? Um, because I think that one thing that really struck me as I was doing this research is that um, we can talk about inequity with, within the canon of art history. And we can talk about what are we doing to diversify the canon? How can we bring in more Latinx, indigenous, African, African diasporic art into the, what we understand as the canon? But how do we account for the fact that 
not all artwork has been not all artwork has 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 had the same chance of survival um, mm -hmm. precisely because of colonialism and because of colonial erasure and so i i've in this project what i've been really focused on is recovering descriptions of art from archives. And so for the Tupac Amaro rebellion, what's really fascinating is that this rebellion spawned like the most massive paper trail in Latin American history, because essentially it was court documentation that was um, that was taken on to essentially um, convict and suppress convict the major players within the rebellion and also suppress future anti colonial movements. So we have thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of archival documents and they're full of artistic descriptions. So one way that I've tried to deal with this is by taking very seriously those descriptions and trying to bring them to make them um, shine by cross referencing with existing visual sources or using them the archival descriptions in these creative ways to reimagine how these objects may have looked. Um, another thing that I'm super fascinated with, not, in, not necessarily for this, for this book, but in general, is how contemporary artists are also looking to some of these same archival sources and creating um, these artworks in honor of, um, of, of insurgents and of heroes of these revolutionary movements. I'm thinking in particular of the work of Fierle Baez, um, a Dominican American artist who did this beautiful series on um, the daughters of, um, of, of um, King Christophe of the Haitian Revolution. And no, there's only one portrait that survives of them, but she basically was doing the historical work to create this really stunning um, uh, mixed media piece. And so what can artists teach us about the historical, um, what can artists teach us about history and about how to use archives and documents in these creative ways that even us as scholars may not be necessarily attuned to. So, um, so thinking to, so I guess looking at the archive creatively, looking to what contemporary artists are doing, um, and also looking to theory. Um, I know the work of Saidia Hartman has been really inspirational for me in terms of critical fabulation. Um, and that is essentially using um, archival documents and, and reshuffling them and reconceptualizing them. And because she understands that these documents are grounded in violence um, and that there's nothing that's, um, the truth value of these documents have to be con um, constantly interrogated. And so the work that she's doing in terms of recovering um, subjectivities of black women in the history of the transatlantic slave trade um, is something that has really made me think differently about how we approach um, the histories of indigenous insurgency. And again, some of the, doing some of that cross um, disciplinary work. Mm. Um, just a follow up, are there any scholars that you know of um, who specialize in African and African diasporic or uh, and as well as indigenous um, art histories like in pre-colonial America, what we would call? Yeah, so well, actually one of my good friends and colleagues, um, Elena Fitzpatrick Sifford, she's working, she has published um, a piece about uh, representations of Africans in colonial Mexico. And she's doing a lot of work on um, indigenous African and African diasporic interactions within the sphere of art history. So I'm happy to maybe in the chat, I could um, link you to her page. Um, but she she definitely comes to mind. Um, and there are other art historians who are doing really interesting work on um, colonial Latin America and um, black indigenous relationships, more within the realm of history, but art history, I think is is slowly starting to catch right. up. 
Right. Yeah. I believe there's a scholar at Harvard. I forget. I should know her name, but she's in there. She's a historian um, who our, one of our professors, Dr. Webb Bender, recommended I reach out to as well. So um, thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. Well, it looks like we have come to the end of our fantastic hour together. Um, and you have shared so much wisdom, so much knowledge, and we are so appreciative um, of your expertise and the time that you spent with our students and program staff today. Um, so thank you so much for that. And we are excited to follow the work that you continue to do um, in the field and really just being the change, you know? So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and for just your thoughtful time with us today. Well, thanks to all of you for making it special, for your amazing questions and comments. Um, you all have me thinking in a million different directions as well. So um, thank you for the opportunity. Say hello to Cheryl for me. I'm so grateful for this and I hope to keep in touch um, and to see how everyone's journeys go in the, in the years to come. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks.